DTM. Perhaps the most resonant, suggestive acronym in the history of saloon car racing. It stands for Deutsche Tourenwagen Meisterschaft, which translates as German Touring Car Championship. For years, it was a place to see massive grids of modified saloon cars swapping paint. But in the early 90s, like so many forms of motorsport, DTM became a technology race. The cars became impossibly complicated and fast, but the racing remained frantic. Today, DTM is at a bit of a crossroads. The cars use a carbon chassis and an overhaul of the technical regulations for the 2012 season saw the brakes, transmission, engine control unit, fuel type and tyres being standardised for all competing brands. The cars remain massively exciting, but the racing isn't quite there just now. So much downforce makes overtaking too difficult, you see. Aussie V8s are a better spectacle than DTM at the moment. But this is a track test. BMW doesn't let people drive these things very often, so when it does let some of us have a decent go in a DTM car, you forget that the racing might be a bit sterile, get on the plane, and then just stand and dribble at the car in all its carbon fibre glory. Hanging with a proper factory motorsport team is always eye-opening. The scale of the resources, the organisation, the, well, cleanliness. The type of person who can stand and gawp at a GT3 RS streetcar, that's me by the way, risks a small infarction if they come close to the M3 DTM. It is staggering. The amount of aero on the bodywork, the carbon safety cell, the, well, the whole thing is just pornographic to a car geek. A DTM car should weigh no less than 1,110 kilograms, including the driver. The motor is a 4-litre V8 pushing 480 horsepower and 370 foot-pounds. The brakes are all carbon. There is no ABS or traction control and the suspension is double wishbones all round. So on the outside, the DTM car doesn't look too different to a modern GT3 car, but the reality is the way it's built and the extreme aerodynamics mean it drives far more like a Formula car or a single-seater, as we say here in Old Englandshire. Now, BMW was understandably nervous about letting untrained animals loose in its very expensive racing car, so the briefing was long. We also had lots of lectures about fire and had to prove that we could extract ourselves from the cabin in under eight seconds. Yellow warning lights meant pit immediately, red ones meant shut it down immediately. If you spin, don't try and start it again yourself. It was all quite intimidating. They even made us wear fancy BMW motorsport race suits. But the cabin is just so cool. You sit in a carbon safety cell and in a heavily padded seat, which is built around Bruno Spengler's body, not mine. The steering wheel is a tiny thing and the dash has zillions of pages of information but I'm only allowed gear indicator and speed. Nothing more to distract me. This is a very, very cool racing car. The finish and the detail is just stunning. Absolutely stunning. There's a fixed test procedure here. Start up, out and straight in, another system to check, then three flying laps to get a feel of the car and the circuit, then a short break to talk to the engineer and 2012 DTM champion Bruno Spengler. I tell him on the last lap of those first three that I braked at 130 metres into turn one. You can brake at 90, he says. Brain frazzled. We go out again for the last eight laps. The in-car audio is completely useless because it's so loud in the cabin. So this is what it sounded like. The car is so agile, it feels nothing like a GT racer. The brakes are the key to the lap time too. You have to smash the middle pedal from 150 miles an hour using 100 newton meters of force. Then, as the aero effect reduces, you bleed off the pedal a bit 
and try and break right into the apex. As the speed decreases, there's not much feel at the front axle, so there are blue lock-up lights on the dash too. Then it's back on the gas and try to manage the oversteer. It's very physical, but the gearbox is an absolute peach. No lock-ups on downshifts and the blip is perfectly measured. There's one high-speed turn on this 2.2km loop we're using. It's a quick break from 5th to 4th and smash right into a 100 mile an hour left-hander. At the time, it felt so good running with the wings and leaning on the aero. The next day, my neck hurt like hell. The motor just spins like a wild man too. I actually have no idea what it was revving to because all I had on the dash were shift lights. But it's the precision that makes this car so special. It's also probably why DTM is struggling to create great racing. The car is almost too advanced, too good at producing downforce and the turbulence that leaves behind. But it's something to drive and appreciate. It's right up there with the best things I've ever driven. After eight laps, I'm called in and then it's the data embarrassment session. I'm actually beginning to get the hang of the brakes but Bruno is so much better at getting the power down. I'm 1.5 seconds slower than him per lap, which means I'm probably just about going fast enough to get a feel for the car itself. Bruno rightly says that the real knack is finding the last four to five tenths. Um, Neil slightly put me on the spot here because I'm naturally a bit wired and um, yeah, kind of energized after driving that amazing racing car. Summary thoughts. <laughs> This point here between the way the car looks and the way the car drives, your eyes tell you it's like a GT car because modern GT3 cars effectively model themselves on the DTM look. But of course this isn't. Under the skin this is a bespoke racing car. So it drives, in its responses it drives like a single seater. So you have to get your hand around that very quickly. The braking performance, I mean you're here on the video, I just go on and on about the brakes. Turn one, um, you know, they're talking about 90 metres for the braking point. I couldn't bring myself to do that. I was too terrified. I was braking at the 100 metre board a bit earlier but the braking performance is astonishing and it has proper aerodynamic braking so you have to hit the pedal hard and then bleed off it. That's counterintuitive, isn't it? That as you come towards the apex, you're actually pulling braking pressure away to get the car turned in. Um, I love just how direct the car is. You sit just enclosed in this driving position. You've got this tiny little steering wheel, the aerodynamic grip at the end of the straight, just awesome. Fifth, fourth, bang, turn, and the car just goes woof through it. As you can see, I'm kind of loving it. Um, we'll have another debrief. As ever with these test drives, I'm left with one lasting impression. Mastering driving the machine is one thing, but just imagine doing so with 20 other lunatics all wanting the same piece of track into turn one. Racing drivers, you've got to love them. Most pair of daps, those.